Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about creating a culture of peace. And it is, we have, we have nine, nine days to go until a general strike. General strike against Congress, against politics as usual, against the status quo. And the status quo isn't necessarily very peaceful. Um, it's definitely something that America has the potential to do better on. And so the American Union model um, will, uh, will give us a chance to improve in a number of different ways. Uh, if you've got any questions about any of the provisions or things that we've covered so far, please uh, type them in the chat and we'll be happy to look back at any of the provisions of the legislation or anything else. Otherwise, um, it's gonna be just sort of an open, open discussion tonight. Creating a culture of peace. Uh, Martin Luther King famously said, peace is not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And yes, so in order to create this culture of peace, we need, we need more justice. Now he recognized there's a couple, couple of different kinds of justice or injustices that, that need to be addressed. Um, one of these is the judicial system. Um, there's a lot of criminal justice reform that's incorpor incorporated into the Blueprint for a Better America. Um, there's a lot, there's opportunities for political peace. Again, so much of America's political system is based, is, is adversarial. The idea that if we can get the two sides mad at each other, if we can get candidates and the voters to fight against each other, that one of them will come out on top and somehow that will produce the best possible result because they fought the hardest. Um, no, it doesn't really work that way. What works better is if instead of those two fight sides fighting, the two sides work together and people work together. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily everyone is going to agree with the result. But if you start with that assumption that we, we are stronger together, that reasonable adults can usually work things out. Um, I recently heard a quote from Thomas Jefferson that said a difference, something along the lines of a difference in opinion does not mean a difference in principle, right? We can, we can agree as a matter of principle on what our goals are, even if we have different opinions about how best to go about them. And that's why constitutional duty is an essential part of the American Union. As you know, we like to start these sessions off by reciting the preamble. So let's remind ourselves what our duties are as Americans. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Those, by establishing those as our principles, our ideals, our goals, the, what we want to accomplish, we can, we can build on those. And so that, we, that means we can still have disagreements about how best to do those things. But when we establish that as our common ground, it's a lot easier to, to build on it uh, when we have that shared foundation. Um, in each of these, each of these things, so um, establish justice, yes, to build, build peace. We've talked about um, how there's going to be a lot of criminal justice reform. I'll go a little more into that in, in a bit here. Um, ensuring domestic tranquility. Again, how do, we, how do we create a culture of peace where we're not fighting? Propose solutions, propose a truce on guns and abortion on these wedge issues and say, look, people are rightfully concerned about needless deaths. But let's do let's do something that will address the root causes and then agree to just take a breather for 10 years. Let's not threaten. We're going to take your guns or your abortions away. Let's just take that off the table for a decade while we address these root causes and um, and take it from there. Um, there is peace when it comes to military conflict. 
And um, so we've got the provide for the common defense. And um, we'll talk more about the, the militaristic aspects of creating a culture of peace. Promoting the general welfare. Um, a lot of this goes towards economic justice. Again, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. And so economic justice, ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to, um, to better participate in, in the economy. Um, we do that by ensuring a basic economic floor for everyone with universal basic income. Um, and securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Again, um, justice and, and peace are inter, interrelated, are parts of uh, go right up and hand in hand with freedom and liberty where um, empowering people to make their own decisions in there um, and not having a government that micromanages their lives uh, enable it reduces the conflict between personal free will and the government telling people what to do. So that ideal of securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, our posterity meaning our children who are going to inherit our country, our planet, and the economic, I'm um, sorry, the environmental injustices that are being done. All right, we've got a, a question in the chat. How can we establish these five duties in our personal lives? Well, let's see. So establish justice. What are you, how do you resolve conflicts in your, your personal life? Um, do you have, do you strive to listen to both sides um, and find a fair and equitable way to, to resolve these things? Or, um, you know, you can think of situations where one side says, this is the way it's going to be. I don't care what you have to say. Um, and so when we think of the criminal justice system, um, thanks to like shows like Law and Order, right? We think of 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 trials as um, as an essential part, despite the fact that ninety seven percent of guilty pleas come from plea bargains and not through actual trials. Um, but what is the purpose of a trial? The purpose is, of a trial is to show both sides to establish the fact and try and establish what has really happened in the pursuit of justice. And so, in our own own lives. Um, we can look for ways that justice is out. We can make sure we're hearing both sides and, and um, look for ways to better establish justice. Ensuring domestic tranquility, again, is being, it would be being active in um, your, own, your own household of trying to de-escalate conflicts, trying to make sure that everyone um, feels like a valued participant Providing for the common defense, um, protect yourself, your others, uh, your family. Um, and, you know, so these, these are duties. Duties are, duties are relative. That's one of the things that sets duties apart from, from rights, uh, is that a right is supposed to be absolute, unquestioned. This is the way it is. It is a blank check that says, this is my right. You owe me you owe me acknowledgement of this, you owe this to me. Whereas duties are relative. So again, going back to the providing for the common defense, I wanna defend my, my family, but my duty to do that is relative to a number of things like time and space and, and so on, right? I have, my duty is different depending on whether I'm walking with my kids in the park and I'm right there, or I'm you know five miles away at work or you know, different things. It's it's relative, um, but providing for the common defense, looking out for the people who are in your family. Um, I was talking with my kids recently about Cuba's new uh, the, their new policy of basically defining a family as a group of people who who love each other. Um, I tried to come up with a definition of a family 
one time. And the way that I came, uh, the sort of the scenario that I envisioned was the, your family are the people that you would share your resources with until you got to the point they couldn't be shared any longer. And so you imagine a scenario where, um, you know, chaos, civilization is breaking down and, um, you know, you've got a certain amount of, of food and resources and stuff in your home and people keep knocking on the door asking if they can come in and the people that you would let in, um, those, that's your family. However, you define it couldn't, can be friends, could be, you know, any people who add value to your life in a way that, um, you would share your, your resources until you couldn't anymore. So family is however you define it. Um, creating a culture piece, uh, promote the general welfare, um, shop local, um, try and, you know, benefit the, try and benefit the economy around you. Um, the economy doesn't work unless people spend money, which is why universal basic income is an essential part of this legislative package, um, to make sure that money is circulating in the economy and we're creating a trickle up economy instead of, a uh, a, a top down, a trickle down economy. Um, welfare, as uh, I believe we've talked about before, means health, happiness, and prosperity. So, besides promoting prosperity, um, promote health and and um, happiness as well. Um, in Buddhism, there's uh, the eight principles or eight ways or, or something, I forget exactly, but one of them is, is um, seek right livelihood. And so to promote health, um, do things, sell things, be in businesses that promote people's health, that promote people to be better um, and uh, avoid occupations and things that do, um, that encourage harm or uh, unhealthy lifestyles. Uh, and then last, um, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Uh, do ensure that people um, respect people's liberty, respect the fact that people will make decisions that you may not necessarily agree with, um, but that are uh, their choices to make. and. Um, that is what it is. So, all right. Well, I hope that answers that question. All right. So we're going to talk about creating a culture of peace and political peace, um, especially again, the goal of the American union is to be the calmer heads that prevail that instead of trying to political parties, try and destroy the peace, try and demonize the other side, try and make the other choice on the ballot looks so evil, so terrible, so unpalatable that you've got to vote for the lesser of two evils. And instead, the American Union is trying to offer a constructive alternative to create a solution that both sides can agree on, both sides can find acceptable. Um, and just as importantly, um, creating a, a, a new team, um, so where Republicans and Democrats are extremely polarizing, uh, we, can off, we can create a, a, a new team, an American union team that are conscientious objectors to this idea of partisan politics that refuses to take sides, but instead focuses on putting policy or partisan politics. So that's one of the ways that we can create uh, political peace. Um, by again, refusing to engage in fighting over who gets elected and instead focusing on what do we want elected officials to do. Um, besides political peace, the American Union uh, is sort of built on a, a Gandhian framework of a constructive program where you've got three, three legs You've got the political aspects, the social aspects, and the cultural aspects. Um, and all of these things are reformed towards a, a unified goal of a more peaceful America. 
Um, and so an essential part of that is the fast for peace. You know, fast is willingly, willingly abstaining from something for a period of time. And so um, the fast for peace is simple enough. It is abstaining from food for 24 hours, just drinking water. And we do this each month on the 15th of a month of the month. Um, you know, and the first time that I, I tried fasting, uh, it lasted 57 hours and it, uh, it was peaceful. Um, there were a few hunger pains here and there, but it was, it was like counting to 10 for an entire day. And by creating this new experience, this opt in experience, because fasting is voluntary. It's not withholding someone's food. It's willingly abstaining from something. Um, there's a difference between fasting and starvation. Um, but by creating this new common shared experience, fasting requires personal action. It's something that everyone can choose to participate in um, if they want. Uh, for the vast majority of Americans, of individuals, fasting is um, is safe, is beneficial for their mental and their physical health, um, which supports some of the other ideas of social and cultural reforms of um, practicing, practicing um, building up our self-control, self-improvement. Um, but we're creating a new, a new shared experience so that no matter what your color of your skin, the religion that you practice, your socioeconomic status, all of these things, um, the fast is a, an, a shared experience because everyone knows what it's like to be hungry and willingly going through this at the same time as every, everyone else. It's not something that you, Jeff Bezos can write a check and say, hey, somebody fast for me. It's got to be something that you personally do. And it's that that willingness, the will to willfully abstain from food, that that intention is what helps create the culture of peace. The fast for peace is um, demonstrating together that we want to work together, that we want to solve these problems, that we want to have peace, to build it, to establish it, to create it, to nurture it, to create an environment where it will grow and blossom. All right, let me go back to some of these, uh, the political reforms here. And uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick. And we'll look at some of these um, other Martin Luther King um, quotes. And so um, let's talk about, so universal basic income. He said, uh, as a guaranteed annual income is what he called it. And, um, Again, instead of proceeding the elimination of poverty, um, the problems of housing and education will be affected if poverty is first abolished. The poor transformed into purchasers will do a great deal on our own. A host of positive psychological changes will, will inevitably result from widespread economic security. The dignity of the individual will flourish when decisions concerning his life are in his own hands, when he has the means to seek self-improvement. Personal conflicts among Husbands, wives, and children will diminish when the unjust measurement of human worth on the scale of dollars is eliminated. Now, our country can do this. You know, um, I've been recently listening to um, J.D. Vance's, uh, his uh, Hillbilly Elegy and talking to the, and listening to the conflicts that he observed um, in the Appalachians growing up. And while at the same time, um, recognizing and, and observing how much poverty is a, is a widespread problem there. And poverty is, creates a lot of economic stress on people. If you don't know you don't feel confident about being able to pay your rent or put food on the table or buy presents for your kids at Christmas time. 
these things create a general atmosphere of stress. And when you're under stress, you're the, the you know, this is the sort of the flight or fight reflex. And so establishing that basic economic security for everyone, as Dr. King said, personal conflicts will diminish um, when we can address these, when we address that, those kind of root, root problems. Um, what are some other problems that will be addressed? We're going to talk more about universal basic income next week, but you think of crime and the, you know, that, that injustice. Poverty is a major driver of crime, right? If you, which makes sense, if you don't have, if you don't have much to lose, then why not go out and, you know, what's, what's the, the risk, your risk of um, punishment, incarceration, whatever. Um, it feels less, less important. Um, and so, yes, creating a culture of peace, um, universal basic income will, will reduce crime and other, other conflicts. Um, we'll also reduce war by ending the endless wars. And let's go back and see what uh, Martin Luther King had to say about Uh, about that. Um, you know, he talked about how as we've increased our troop supports, uh, troop commitments in support of governments, which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. You can see this in a number of, of um, places around the world where the United States does this, where we ally sell ourselves with um, governments which are singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular supports. Um, in order to, well, I guess I'm not entirely sure what, um, but this is not a, a, this is still going on today. Um, the way that we've destroyed, destroyed families, destroyed villages, uh, impacted cultures around, especially around the Middle East, um, where we have, as he said, um, we've destroyed their land and their crops. Now there's little left to build on, save bitterness. We must speak for them and raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. And so creating a culture of peace um, means speaking for those who cannot speak, making sure that they're, they're um, represented and looked after and included and that justice is Justice is for all, um, not just those with money, the loudest voices, any of those things. Um, and this is especially true in global conflicts um, where we are, <sighs> yeah, there's so many, so many global conflicts where we're um, not, where American, I don't know if I want to say superiority, but the American American goals are um, trample on the needs, desires, the local cultures um, in a way that does not um, create a general culture of peace. Um, and then we also want to talk about criminal justice reform. And, you know, serving in the legislature is interesting to go back and, and read some of the old, um, old laws, things that would, would come up before us sometimes. And you'd find references in the code um, to peace officers that um, members of, it wasn't the police, it wasn't law enforcement, they were peace officers. That was their goal and their responsibility to do these things, to establish justice in our communities. Uh, to keep the peace, um, de-escalate conflicts, not to um, not to wield oppressive authority. Um, our criminal justice system also creates a lot of unnecessary conflicts, problems, where 
many people have recognized have talked about, um, for example, um, issues of um, black fathers, right? Where, where are the missing, missing fathers? Um, this is something, you know, people like Barack Obama and whatever have, have talked about um, as a concern for the, the community. And the answer is, is that well, there are many of them that are incarcerated and have been taken away from, taken away from their families. That many who have been saddled with felony convictions or criminal records or things that have been handicapped in their ability to provide uh, an income for their family. And these are things that continue to create, um, create conflicts and, and, and other problems. Um, there was a study a few years ago that found that a family with, a, uh, with an incarcerated member um, incarcerated parent was 40% more likely to be living in poverty. And then poverty, as, we, as we've talked about, brings up its, all, its own set of problems. Um, there's another study that, that uh, looked into the effects of, of poverty and how it could lower, uh, lower your IQ. Um, because again, that economic stress of worrying about your basic needs um, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those, those safety and security needs, worrying about whether or not those would be met instead of being able to take them for granted, which is something that people with basic economic security can do. So they can focus on those higher level, um, those higher level needs of creating strong relationships, of self-improvement, of self, self-actualization, of reaching their, their full potential. Um, and so, so those are some of the ways that, uh, that the American Union model can work to create a culture of peace. Uh, question in chat. Will establishing these duties in our personal life help move us towards the solutions proposed in the Blueprint for a Better America? Um, whether they do or not, um, this is, these are our duties as Americans to try and do these things, that this is how we, we build a better America, is that it starts with ourselves. And when there's this, um, this shared perception, this shared goal, this shared vision of an America that, that does these things, then it becomes so much easier to accomplish when we all agree on what, what our goals are. And we're fortunate that the framers laid out a clear um, gave us a clear mission statement of five duties uh, that we should focus on. Oh. So by, yes, so by living them in our own personal life does help improve, um, does help advance this, this model of, um, of widespread adoption of the, um, of this idea, of this concept of the American Union model of accepting these duties um, individually and as a country, and then moving ourselves forward. That, that difference, in, difference in opinion does not have to mean a difference in principle, um, that those shared principles can lead to a shared vision and building a better America. Um, I think that's probably most of what I have for on the agenda for tonight for creating a culture of peace. Um, again, peace starts with us. Change starts with us. Um, you know, the fast for peace is a way that we can individually demonstrate our own commitment to working for these things. Now, as part of my own personal commitment, I've been fasting since the publication of the final blueprint on September 24th. And I will continue until October 15th, um, the fast for peace, and for a full 21 days. And um, I'm feeling, feeling pretty good, a little tired today, not too bad. Uh, my weight is at 182 pounds. And uh, um, yeah, the fast is still going okay. I'm not, uh, it's, it's day 13 for me, and it's... Um, 
it's not become problematic yet. At some point, it will be more unpleasant. But I'm still in the still in the, the good good spot. Um, final thoughts on creating a culture of peace. Look, we can do this. There are a lot of industries, a lot of companies, a lot of political parties that are invested in creating conflict. I'm reminded of at the end in World War II, not long before um, the British uh, left India and, and turned it over to the Indian people, they were actually bribing Muslim religious leaders to preach against the Hindus. Uh, that they were they were sowing conflict to keep people divided, and again, there are a lot of there's a lot, especially as we're watching all these negative campaign ads on on the on TV and the internet and everything at this time of years. Uh, there's a lot of energy into creating a negative space space into creating conflict, and we don't have to play that game. They can try and make us angry, but if we are committed to working for peace, we can decline to, to do so. We can instead focus on what it is that we want to accomplish instead of um, trying to accept and um, instead of, of trying to uh, get drawn, instead of being drawn down into this, into the political swamp that, uh, that is partisan politics today. So, all right. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. And tomorrow we're going to finish out Title III, um, the last section on improving America's moral standing in the world. So if we want to create a, person, a, a culture of peace, which we do, we as a nation can be a better example on the world stage. We can lead by example, as we talked about yesterday with nuclear, nuclear de-escalation, that we can lead by example um, and not, wait, not necessarily, and wait, not wait for anyone else. And so tomorrow we'll talk more about some of the ways that we can lead by example, that we can be a better role model for the rest of the world. So, all right, with that, thank you. And